Hi, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to talk about the student debt crisis. I am Pam Brown, and I'm an activist with OWS. And um, I'm also a graduate student at the New School for Social Research here in New York City. Um, so today is a, um, a very grim milestone that we are reaching, which is that we have a trillion dollars worth of uh, student loan debt right now here in the United States. And there's many um, estimations of um, when we hit that trillion dollar mark. Some include interest, some don't. So today is the day, though, that we are having um, national actions throughout the country to commemorate, to draw attention to it, and also to inspire people to hopefully um, start a new movement here um, to make education a right. Education really already is a right, but we really need to um, take that back. So um, just to understand what a trillion dollars actually is, a trillion dollars, is um, literally it's $4,000 for every man, woman, child in America right now today. Um, this is more than any other form of debt. It's more than credit card debt. It's more than automobile debt. Um, it's a huge number. In fact, if you had, if you take one, if you say one dollar is equal to one second, then uh, one trillion is actually equal to 31,546 years. So this is an enormous uh, problem. We have 58 percent of Americans who have college degree who are over the age of 25 carrying student loan debt. Two-thirds of the class of 2010 borrowed on average $25,000 each. And it breaks down across racial lines where you have one and four uh, white students owing less than $13,000. You have one in three black students owing more than $38,000. Um, right now, you've got 41% of the class of 2005 delinquent or in default. So with statistics like these, there's virtually no uh, question that these are predatory loans, that the system is unsustainable, that debtors are not the only ones who uh, pay the consequences, as Ellen was just uh, re referencing in her talk, and also that we have a moral obligation to, um, to change this. Um, so for the most Americans look at this issue as a simple You got the education. You agreed to pay for it. You can't give back your brain, so suck it up and get to work. Unfortunately, this kind of uh, logic misunderstands the, system, the systemic sources um, by which that's generated this enormous amount of debt. Um, and also, it misunderstands the long-term inequality that this is really creating. Um, and it's particularly dangerous now that we have reached this uh, crisis trillion dollar mark. Um, where many, many reports have already begun to theorize this as the next bubble. But it's not the kind of bubble that might burst like the real estate market, of course. It's the kind of bubble that has the potential to just slowly ooze and create suffering for uh, recent generations who have been forced into this situation and much greater economic disparity for the 99%. Uh, so when you look carefully at this crisis, you can see that it's been caused by uh, complex interrelationships between four specific entities. You have um, the government, and um, you have the lenders, the banks, that it is. You have the educational institutions, and you also have the student consumer, let's say. And um, most Americans, I think, believe that because the federal government has either guaranteed the loans or has originated them, that these loans are fundamentally benevolent, that this is a way of expanding educational opportunity. Um, unfortunately, that's actually not really a correct assessment. Before the 1970s, government grants and programs like the GI Bill actually paid for most of the cost of education. What happened? Back then, as we believe that education looked good um, and that it should really be made available, it was actually in 1972 that um, using this sort of neoliberal neo logic of shrinking government that Nixon established uh, the infamous Sally May. 
And Sally Mae was originally a governmental agency, actually. It was a part of the government. And um, it began to grow. And by 1981, they had already started lobbying efforts. By 1997, they were making uh, direct loans. And by 2004, they became a private uh, company, although that's a, a technicality in a lot of ways. Um, tracking this, during the same period, loans to uh, students increased while consumer protections decreased, finally uh, disappearing. So you started out with bankruptcy protection and you started out with protected wages, like for example, Social Security and disability. And starting in 1996, Social uh, Security became eligible. So uh, for collection. If you default, then by the time you're you know, a senior citizen, they're just going to take it out of the only uh, income that you have. Um, in 1998, bankruptcy was removed for federally backed loans. And then in 2005, we really crossed a line where bankruptcy protection was removed for private loans as well. So you can see that there is this interrelationship between the public and the private and they're crossing over each other and it's not clear at what point we're dealing with which. Um, between 1995 and 2000, um, the same period of time when government did these consumer protections, the lenders saw enormous profits. I mean enormous. Sally May um, increased profits by 1700%. Okay. By 2005, Sally Mae became the second most profitable co uh, company in this country. So, um, and during the, from 1980 until now, uh, tuition has increased, and this is just an average because it differs between public and private, but it's increased about 500%. Okay. So in 1976, CUNY, City University of New York, for those who are not in New York, um, was completely free. And uh, today, now we have this public education that's actually paid for by students going into private individual debt, okay? So this debt is actually a form of privatization, privatization which has um, been encouraged by the government. Um, so let's see. It, these private institutions are financed through the student debt. And all uh, this, uh, this private, this uh, private debt, and this is coming from public money. Um, these private institutions are completely unaccountable. There's no rules or regulations to what they can do. There's no oversight. They do not have to show us where they spend the money, and that is a huge problem right now because it's very difficult to get hard facts on where the money goes when you, um, when the institutions don't have to actually show you that. Now, in New York City, we can see that um, visibly, wherever we go, we see, you know, in, in areas where we have universities, we see massive building projects. The new school is putting up a building on 14th and 5th Avenue. I view myself as owner in some of the most expensive real estate in the world because that was predicated on student debt, right? Students are paying for this. Um, so tuition hikes are not checked, of course, by um, in a situation when when the student borrows money from a school or from sorry from a bank or the government, which now does direct lending, not like buying a house where they they evaluate how are you going to pay this money back, um, which would mean that there was some pressure on the rising costs. Instead of that, it's completely unchecked. You can just qualify and and walk away. Um, so these tuition increases, the 500% increase, is completely contingent on the ability to go into debt. These tuition increases are authorized by boards of trustees, which are comprised of wealthy uh, individuals who frequently benefit from investment in financial markets um, um, that are uh, buoyed by decreasing student debt. Um, let's see. Um, now, I just want to talk about one last thing, which is that uh, in terms of these four entities, there are very, um, there is, the final entity is, who's involved in this mix is really the student, right? 
Um, and more often than not, the student takes on this debt while they're not even of legal age. In other words, you can go into $100,000 worth of debt in this country before you can actually legally get a beer. Okay, So that's just to put it a little bit in perspective. And so um, just to sort of wrap up my talk here, um, sorry to leave you with all those numbers. I do want to leave you with some can uh, do about this problem. I think you've been cut off. Uh, oh, sorry about that. There was a technical glitch. Um, really quickly, um, as part of Occupy, Occupy Student Debt Campaign, we are um, part of a new movement um, that aims to end the debt financing of higher education. We believe that education is a right and knowledge should not be a source of profit for Wall Street. And so we propose a strategy of nonviolent direct action to take back higher education and our complicity with a predatory just system. Um, we have a pledge of refusal where we are collectivizing a million uh, people who owe student debt toward a, a campaign of non-cooperation with Wall Street. And we hope that by withholding upwards of $27 billion ultimately and gathering around that, then um, we can actually do something to change this because, of course, many of the things that have happened thus far have not been successful, like petitioning the government or asking for change. Um, so you can find out more by visiting OccupyStudentDebtCampaign.org or join us today by visiting 1TDay.org. OccupyStudentDebtCampaign.org, 1TDay.org. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.